those food webs and the food chains. And I talked about this a little bit at the beginning. I talked about omnivory. I talked about the idea of eating at multiple levels of the food web and how isotopes can help tease some of this apart. Um, but we can think of very simplistically of producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, from a simple linear viewpoint, or we can think about food webs with complexity with different trophic levels. And it's a more difficult view of the world, but this is probably a more accurate view. If you can simplify to this point and it's close enough to reality, then it becomes useful. And we'll do that, <coughs> excuse me, when we talk about uh, trophic cascade in a minute. What, um, when we talked about microbial communities, what was the name of the nonlinear viewpoint that we had for the food web on the microbial side of things? Do you remember that? Here's the food web that we started everything with. This is clearly not a food chain, right? It's just the way the real world is. And we'll talk about how we do assume there is a food chain. And it's, you know, parts of, of a food web in a lake, this works well. We have this microbial loop spinning around, but I talked about the microbial loop kind of going fast and then the rest of the food web skimming off the top of that. And you can view that skimming off the top of that as occurring in a chain. Um, and it's, there's, a, there's an Italian uh, scientist that in the 1880s postulated that predators can control herbivores and increase the biomass of producers. So the idea that if you have a food chain with levels, something that's two levels up has a positive effect on you. Something that's one level up has a negative effect on you. And this has led to a discussion in the literature on top-down versus bottom-up control. In the very general sense, an argument was made 60 years ago that the reason that the world is green is that large predators control herbivore biomass. That is the reason that when you go out in Kansas in the summer and there's trees out there and grass that doesn't get all eaten up, it's because there are large predators that are controlling the biomass of those organisms. The problem with that is that it means that you have this view of it, it's difficult to come up with the ev long-term evolutionary sta stability of that. Um, so the question is why don't herbivores just find a way to get around the predators and eat the plants anyway over evolutionary time? And so this brings up this idea of whether nutrients and light control primary production in aquatic systems of bottom-up control, or whether the herbivory controls primary production, the top-down control. <coughs> and because of this <coughs> idea that there are some times when top-down control works, it turns out we can use biomanipulation to control trophic state. And I promised to have talked to you about this when we were in the eutrophication chapter, and now I am fulfilling my promise to you. So we can think of two lake food webs. We have algae at the bottom. We have a whole lot of daphnia if there's not very many fish that are eating the daphnia. And the way that can happen is you have a large predator that's eating the small fish. So if you have a food web that's structured this way, you'll tend to have a lower biomass of algae. So the things that we don't like about eutrophic lakes, taste and odor problems, right? Lack of clarity can be somewhat remedied by making sure that your, food, your structure of your food web is like this. In contrast, if we get rid of this large predator, then the small predators, the, the secondary consumers, that's tertiary consumers, really hit the zooplankton hard. We end up with really small species. And the small species like rotifers and small daphnias are less efficient predators on the algae. And so then we get algae that is at a higher biomass. <coughs> and we also get algal species that perhaps are um, less sensitive to grazing. So things that would make better food for these large zooplankton are getting taken out of the algal population. Here you get an algal shift and you might have less, uh, less predation resistant algae. And this idea that I already mentioned that large zooplankton are more efficient filters and predators of algae than small zooplankton are was first put out by Brooks and Dodson and they 
they prove that this is actually the case, that large daphnia tend to be more efficient at taking algal cells out of solution, so they're better predators. Um, but we also already showed that the, the large daphnia are the preferred food, right? So we've got this trade-off and these shifts in the community. Okay, so let's say we have a eutrophic lake. How would you suggest that we would, um, what would be a good way to make the food web more like this than like this in a practical management sense? Larger predators, like big predators that control the... Large predators, right. So how do you manage for large predators in a lake? And make sure there's a prey base. For the you make sure there's a prey base. Well, that's sort of assumed, right? I mean, that there's some of a prey base. Yeah. I'm asking you fish management questions. Can you make a, like a fishing net rules where you have to have a uh, size limit, so you only take out the intermediate sized fish and can't take out fish. Yeah, limit. that's good. Size. So what's that called? Slot, Slot limits. Jeez, I can't believe I'm making you guys. You're supposed to know all this cold. Yeah, so you could have slot limits. Uh, you could just make people release large predators. So this catch and release thing, people do recreationally can have an added benefit, essentially. And the, the other benefit to that is those large fish oftentimes are old and they concentrate a lot of mercury and you don't want to keep them anyway. And you, know, you want to eat the small ones because they grow quick and you don't bioaccumulate nearly as fast. What's another way you could do it? make it a much nicer system. You just get rid of all the fish, right? Yeah. <laughs> you just put rotenone in and you can get rid of them all and then you have a nice clean low algae lake with big beautiful daphne in it. And then, uh, you guys don't, aren't buying that one. Huh? You're sick. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah, so, um, and, and this has been demonstrated to work in the short term in lakes. Unfortunately, in the long term, it's not always so successful. And um, one of the reasons that this is, uh, is that it's been tried in smaller ponds. And so if you push things in smaller ponds so you have less algae, what happens to the life at the bottom of the pond? Is it increasing or decreasing? It increases. And what happens if you have a pond and you get a lot of light down to the bottom? What can grow? Macrophytes. Macrophytes, right? And so what you do is you shift the system over to a macrophyte dominated system and the primary production pops back up again. And it can and it can be very dense if there's a lot of nutrients there, it can be too dense for people to, for people to enjoy. So you, so over longer periods of time you have these responses to um, changes in predation shift that can just shift the whole community another stable state, right? And then it becomes very difficult to get back to this open water phase without the removal of the magnifies. So there's um, times when it doesn't work so well. And it, the other thing is that you only have a limited amount of control for the <coughs> So really, ultimately, if you want to control eutrophication, the best thing to do is to just make it so this high algal population can't grow in the first place by controlling nutrients, and we talked about the way you can do that from the watershed <coughs> and management technique. But that said, if you, if you have a system that you want to try to tweak a little bit, um, then you can do this and, and have it be closer to you know, the optimum what people want. Big fish, clear water. They want a swimming pool that has big fish in it, basically. So you can push towards that as a manager and make people a little bit happier with what they've got. So this is just an example of biomanipulation that proves that where they have a lake and, and they had some lakes in the Netherlands that they, that, they, that they just removed all the fish. So they just took my ladder suggestion. They removed almost all the fish out of the lake. Um, and then, and this is over a period of years, then they have the Daphnia population skyrocketed when they first took them out, right? But then they dropped off. And the planktonic chlorophyll was very high, so this removal of fish had a really dramatic effect on the planktonic chlorophyll. Initially, because the daphnia drove it down, but then, 
as the macrophyte cover went up to 80% of the lake surface, right? The, this stayed low, but the daphnia didn't do so well. Uh, just to prove that in a real system, that that's what happens. Is, is How do you control macrophyte compost even when they get high? Yeah, so we talked about that a little bit. You can dump chemicals on them, which can have unintended consequences and not necessarily positive. Uh, you, if it's not a really large lake, you can go out and harvest them. So you just cut them down like cutting your lawn. So a lot of people say in the upper Midwest, Minnesota, they have their lake homes and they just go out and they, they rake out or cut out the macrophytes to keep their swimming areas open. Uh, so there's a variety of ways some species that are talking about biological control, so if you have a very specific species you want to get rid of, and there's a, an insect that, that specializes on, say, eating their flowers or their seeds, then you can, you can use that upon in some special situations. And then we also talked about low levels of grass carp being the way to do it. So if you put in just the right amount of grass carp, it'll, it'll knock them down to a degree, but not get rid of all of them. So the balance system, you want to have some macrophytes, some open water, right? And that makes it so you've got good, good heterogeneity for the fish populations. Uh, so prey fish can get refuge in the macrophytes if they're not choking out the entire system. Adam? Yeah, uh, so how does that like relate to like lake size? Like if it was a really big lake, would that still, would they expect the same effects? Like, I mean, I don't know how big these lakes were, but I was assuming they would be small but like once you get a bigger lake you know there's less light to go down to the depth right so yeah no that's a very good question that you if you have a really large lake you're not going to have the macrophytes except for around the edge if it's a deep lake as well now there, if it's a large lake like lake okeechobee in florida where the average depth is maybe a meter or two then you can get these huge suspended algal growths um as i mean sorry so, um, rooted macrophyte growths and and or in an alternate stable state, huge suspended algal growth. So, it, you know, it's, the answer is it depends. If the lake's big, um, it's not so much big as how deep is it. Yeah. And related to trophic cascade is, is why is it that it's so com commonly talked about in the lakes and not other systems? And people have looked at it in rivers, and this is work that <coughs> Mary Power has done. <coughs> And she has, it has been found in other systems, in streams and rivers. And this is an example in California where the largest predator is a, is a steelhead. And then there's, um, there can be large uh, roach, which is another fish, and roach and stickleback. And these get eaten by the steelhead if it's there, as well as the predator, large predatory insects. And so if you put in the large predatory fish, the midge larvae do really well, and they knock back the benthic algae. And in this case, the benthic algae is actually cladophora, a filamentous green alga. And the midge doesn't necessarily directly eat it, but it pulls it apart and uses it to make its case, uh, a case. And so it, it uses it to protect itself, but it also knocks back the actual biomass of the algae. But then they put in cages and took out the steelhead, uh, and the predatory insects and the smaller fish really took off, not the midge larvae way down, and the benthic algae came up substantially. So this is very, very similar to what we saw in the lakes with the large fish, the small fish, the zooplankton, and the phytoplankton. Although we're, you know, we're, it's a, a little bit different food web. Um, but there are systems where you really don't see this, and, and so the question is, why is it that you might see it sometimes and not see it others? And one of the, one of the issues is that if you have a very complex food web, that if you have a lot of omnivory, and if you have a lot of organisms eating at different trophic levels, then you're not going to have this distinct alternating levels, right, where you have the effect of one on the next and the next. And so if you have more of a food web than a food chain, the chances are a lot less that you'll have a very clear trophic cascade effect. You can think of systems like um, marine systems where are more diverse, tend to be more diverse, particularly intertidal. Things like co coral reefs, perhaps, um, might be more diverse. Although, 
Um, there is some examples of, of uh, trophic cascades and coral reefs where they have these fish, um, these no fishing zones, you actually get a shift in the community structure. So, so we can see some weak signals of that. And we see it less often put that way in terrestrial systems, although the same kinds of things, when you take out the large predators, then the herbivores go way up, and then you see the biomass of the plants going down. So, for example, in um, Yellowstone, when they put the wolves back in, they start taking out the elk and the, and the deer, and the, and the um, riparian vegetation came back substantially. So, so there can be trophic cascades in other systems as well. Um, there's been a, uh, a review by David Curry of, of, of the success of trophic cascade and, and, and top-down and bottom-up <coughs> control in predicting the response of aquatic systems. And they found that if it was going to break down at all, it generally tended to break down at the zooplankton, phytoplankton interface in lakes. That is, there appear to be ways that organisms can adapt to the predation. So it's either the algae, the algae grow that are resistant to predation or the zooplankton have ways of escaping that predation. So if it's going to break down, that's where it's at. The other problem with this is using it in extremely eutrophic or oligotrophic systems. And so some of the experiments that have been done in oligotrophic lakes have shown very little evidence for alteration of the food web effects on the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, mainly because they're so limited by the nutrient influx rates. In, and then once the algae are limited by, heavily limited by nutrients, if you remember from the stoichiometry part, they'll have a really high carbon content relative to the nitrogen and phosphorus content. So the zooplankton will be actually limited by the nitrogen and phosphorus they can get from their food, not by how much they're being eaten from above. And then you add this to the fact that they're kind of dispersed uh, in, in the lake and they're hard to, it takes a lot of energy for the predators to get at them. So they're really, predation is probably not the biggest factor controlling them. And the most extreme case we can talk about is this ultra oligotrophic lake where there's so low nutrients that, like I talked about Waldo Lake and there's some others like that, where the nutrients are so low, there's essentially no zooplankton community, very little phytoplankton, and, no, and it can support no fish. So obviously in that case, it's so strongly bottom-up controlled that there's not gonna be any influence at all. Um, Mary Power also, the first time that this was actually shown, this idea for trophic cascade in streams, was in Oklahoma streams just to the south here by Lake Texoma. And she took um, bass and removed them from different pools. The first thing she did is just surveyed pools to uh, streams and saw if there were bass in those pools or not. And when the bass weren't there, the herbivorous minnow, um, Campasta anomalum, the, the stone roller, central stone roller, uh, concentrations were high and the algal concentrations were low. If the bass was there, then the stone rollers weren't there and the benthic algae was high. So that was one of the first places she showed that. And then she did an ex sort of a, an extreme experiment, I think, um, in that she took a fish line and she tethered bass in pools so that they could only go in a circle. And in that case, they'd had this area where the circle of algae was, and, the, and then right outside the circle was all grazed down. So the stone rollers, as we talked about, when we talked about predatory interactions, um, if they know a predator can only go so far, then they'll get up to the edge of where that predator can go and, and go ahead and graze, graze the edges of, of that. Um, the one thing that, that perhaps was a little bit uh, weak about that study was that she didn't account for the effect of crayfish, which are also known to be in these systems and can also be substantial herbivores. And, and bass probably have the effect on the crayfish as well. So it's not clearly, not necessarily just an effect on the stone rollers, but it could also be an effect on, on, on other herbivorous organisms in that habitat. Are there instances where you have like an initial cascade, but like you said, like Daphnia or some kind of zooplankton have a response to predation and then that cascade, the effects aren't seen as much or as strongly? Um, so I think that it's a little less likely in rivers and streams where, uh, is that what you're asking about rivers and streams or are you asking in general? In any instance. Well, there's the one example we already talked about where the macrophytes take off and, and um, the 
And if you clear, if you basically clear the water column of, of phytoplankton, then light can get to the bottom and macrophytes take off, and then you've got a lot of primary production again that doesn't have anything to do with the trophic control. So there's a fairly good case for that happening in lakes, less of so in rivers and streams, particularly those that are somewhat disturbed because you don't have the possibility for macrophytes to even get established, number one, and number two, usually they're shallow enough that they get enough light anyway, so that's, it's not as, not as common in, in those systems. Um, but you can, we can already think of, of times when we have resistance to grazing, so we can think back to that example of the hot spring and at Hunter's Hot Spring where there was the oscillatoria that grew out over the surface, but when the ostracod came up to its te lower te upper temperature limit, right, it would take that ostracod out and then you get a shift to the calothrix um, 